Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And there's the man himself, the the mayor, the governor, the legend in multifamily real estate. It's Mr. Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. Michael, how are you? Things are going well. How's uh, 2020 treating you now that we're in the new year? We're doing all right. You know, we're a national lender, so we are seeing transactions throughout the United States. And so we've been active. We were active in December. So the fruits of of December are rolling over till January, and so we're closing loans uh, throughout the country. So uh, not not too bad for 2020. And how about for you guys over at SBI? Uh, we're trying to find something new to new to put together. It's a tough world. Uh, where you know our guests will kind of is contributing to part of the problem with the, the prices going up out in the marketplace. <laughs> so uh, we're out there trying to get a uh, get something under contract and hopefully put it out in the first uh, end of the first quarter. So you know we'll we'll, we'll get out and make it happen. I so. know you guys are hard workers, so I have full faith and trust that you guys will find some. Some opportunities out there for you and your investors. And so don't forget, again, we're, we're in 2020. If you think we bring value to the multifamily conversation, go back into iTunes. It would definitely help us to give us a five-star rating or you know, a thumbs up or maybe some comments about what you think, how we do in our podcast. We thoroughly uh, appreciate you guys going into the iTunes or Stitcher and just leaving some additional comments. That definitely helps. Also, too, we are just about to update the 2020 2020. Uh, multifamily white paper, multifamily white paper. It is kind of a checklist of what you need to know. Since we bring in 70, 80% of the money to the table, we are definitely, hopefully are going to be your best friend. You know, we're the lender in the, the transaction. So we bring in the majority of the money. So you definitely want to go into oldcapitalpodcast.com and download that 17 page white paper report that also comes with Michael Becker's due diligence. And Michael, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, we put the sample due diligence checklist in there. So, so the checklist that the kind of the Christmas wish list of all the uh, diligence information that we want uh, that we attach to our LOI. So it's a pretty comprehensive list. And so feel free to. Is this the one you guys really use? Uh, it's the one we really use. And I've actually seen LOI submitted to me that uh, they plagiarized it. So <laughs> I guess that's kind of flattering. So uh, we're, we're, we're making a difference out in the world, I guess. That's great. Uh, yeah. Just make sure you take the SBI off the logo on the, uh, <laughs> the logo off the letterhead. That definitely would help if, if Michael Becker's getting his own uh, checklist. So that's, that's not good. And so, uh, also, do not forget, do not forget, if you're going to go to the oldcapitalpodcast.com website, look for a place there that is going to have Dr. Dots or Dr. Mark Dots or the doctor is going to be in the house in April. So we need an RSVP. You know, as you know, Mark Dotzer is one of the probably the funniest and right on economist, real estate economist. He's the guy that everybody listens to that goes to all of his conferences, whether you're a banker, or you're an investor or just want to be knowledgeable about what's going on in not just Texas, not just the national piece, but also the, the world, what's going on with the economics throughout the United States. You know, he does it, you know, hour and a half, two hours kind of summit. We have him coming to see us, coming to see you in April. So, uh, Michael, what do you think about uh, Dr. Dustin? Yeah, I think he's, uh, the, takes a pretty dry subject to make it very entertaining. So I'd uh, certainly encourage you guys to come out and see him speak. Well, that's great. So we were just talking about how difficult it is to find opportunities these days. You know, in the, in the space that Michael is in, which is probably the, what do you, what do you say, A-? A minus, A, A minus, B plus space. Everybody tries to get into that space. If you're starting off in the B and C, probably more specifically in the C space, some period of time you want to grow up and be like Mike, be like Mike in the A, A minus space. And so you got to know the people, the players, you know, whether you do it today or you do it in the future, you got to know the players that are actually selling this type of real estate. And so in the podcast today, we have one of the probably the best investment sales guys in the industry. You know, he just happens to be based here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He works for a company called Marcus & Millichap. And you may be familiar with Marcus & Millichap. They do a lot of the A, B, and C properties. They sell a lot of multifamily properties. They're probably the preeminent name out there. But he works in a special niche, a special niche of the Marcus & Millichap group called the IPA. And so without further ado, I'm going to have Michael introduce Joey. And then kind of go through a little bit about what Joey does. 
So we got Joey Tubinella on the podcast. So IPA stands for what, Joey? Uh, institutional Property Advisors. That's right. So they, you guys are kind of in the – maybe telling your own words, kind of what's the difference between, say, your guys' group and kind of your your bread and butter, Marcus Miller Chap, uh, investment sales agent. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on the program, guys. So I get the question a lot. The biggest difference is uh, it's all the same company. So Marks and Millichap is a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, IPA is just a division of Marks and Millichap. I mean, we typically work in the institutional space primarily. That's our mandate. But a majority of our book of business is value add of what we sell around the state. And I specifically focus in the Dallas Fort Worth market. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, before we get too too deep into it, maybe give a little bit of background on yourself. How did you? Uh, you're not a native uh, native Texan, and we're recording this the day after uh, LSU just won their uh, second national championship or third or something like that. Number number three. So, uh, so I think everyone from Louisiana is probably still drunk from yesterday's <laughs> uh, celebration. But uh, so we appreciate you coming in today. But yeah, maybe get a little bit bit of background kind of on yourself and how did you get to uh, sell apartments in Texas? Yeah. There's no question people are still celebrating. Yes, yeah, so my background is pretty straightforward. I'm born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Came to Texas for school, went to TCU in Fort Worth, and then... Does that mean that you were born with a daiquiri in your hand? <laughs> <laughs> you can make that argument for sure. My mom and dad would probably tell you otherwise. Um, but no, I, I went to TCU for school and then stayed afterwards. I actually interned with the current team in 2013, and we were really in high growth mode. Uh, we are trying to add people who can come in and make an impact in Dallas, Fort Worth. I mean, I said that's a, a job and a role that I felt like I could contribute towards. So I started full on in 2015. And this is all I've ever done is multifamily investment sales. And I'm just trying to add value to the team. Yeah. And we've done, I think, five or six transactions together. I know you sold some stuff for us. And we bought some stuff for you guys. So uh, this is one of the one of the guys that we actually, you know, uh, do business in Dallas, Fort Worth with and, you know, is a player in town. So those of you guys looking to kind of, you know, either do anywhere from the value out space up to, you know, brand new institutional product. They kind of sell a little bit of a little bit of everything. So maybe talk a little bit about how you guys are set up here. I know you're based in Dallas Fort Worth, it's where the team's headquartered, but you also cover the secondary markets as well as San Antonio slash Austin and Houston as well. So maybe kind of talk about your guys' team and maybe maybe do a little recap of twenty nineteen and kind of the volume of uh, what you guys have done. So give the listeners a little perspective of uh, of what you guys do at IPA out of out of Dallas. Yeah, absolutely. So a little background on the platform. So Will Balthrop, our executive director and head of kind of state strategy, started the team back in 07. And my now partner, Drew Kyle, was in management in the Fort Worth office. He had opened the Fort Worth office for Marcus and Millichap. They teamed up after a late 07, and that was right around the time the company was starting the IPA brand. And now here we are, you know, a little under 13 years later, and the strategies have changed a little bit. So I always tell people we're a little unique relative to our competitors um, and how we're set up. So we have a back office of 16 plus people I'm up here in Addison who support the entire state. So that's secondary markets, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, opposed to satellite offices across the state, you know, for how some of our competitors structure it. So you know, I'm one of the two partners in Dallas Fort Worth. Drew and I run all of our strategy and investment sales here in the market. And then we have a couple of junior brokers under us who help with the execution of those strategies. So a little bit about the background of 2019. You know, 2019 was a really interesting year because I think most folks could attest to it. Q1 was pretty turbulent coming off of Q4 2018 with the stock market going backwards significantly, rates ticking up over 25 basis points. And if you look at uh, our business is very much pipeline focused, right? And so if you look at our pipeline this time last year, there weren't a lot of people looking for proposals. There weren't a lot of people looking for inventory to take to market. And so you look at the Q1 results of last year, and we only closed one asset in 2019 Q1. So we had a lot of catch up to you know make good on our goals and, and what we we're trying to set out to achieve. So 2018, we did a little over a billion in sales in Dallas-Fort Worth, which was a record year for us. And then 2019, we were flat year over year, right at about a billion in sales, slightly over 20 transactions. And so it was a good year. If you look at our trailing six months, you know, we closed over seven assets in November and December. So we really had to hustle. Give me the idea of a size of the transaction, because when people come into the multifamily space, I mean, and they're buying these B minus and C plus properties, I mean, they're looking at anywhere from, you know, two, three, four 
seven million dollar deals. So tell us a little bit about in the space that you guys are in. Yeah, a big piece of our I segmented into three parts. The majority of say sixty percent of our business is. 70s through mid 90s vintage value add to specifically answer your question our average deal size is about 60 million but if you look at the last couple of months we've really targeted kind of that 30 to 50 million dollar space with this I'll say new team approach that we've taken very seriously uh, in the last 18 months so a lot of the listeners probably are familiar with Nick Flellen and Bart Hoover Al Silva, all of which have been on the podcast before, and they have a niche, you know, kind of grown their business from $3 million to that $20 million space. And there's a lot of institutional groups, as well as private capital groups who are playing down in that space to look for more yield. Mike mentioned it earlier, it's a very tight market, it's tough to find yield right now. And Dallas Fort Worth still has the metrics that, you know, check the box for acquisition criteria. It's just you have to be a lot more selective in today's market. And so, you know, a couple of deals that we've transacted on recently, you know, two in Irving that we worked on at the end of last year, that the activity was through the roof. You know, we did collectively north of 110 tours, which I think was almost a record in the past. So what does a tour mean? I mean, a lot of people who are just into this business, they understand what, what a tour means. Sure. When you go out there, how much time do you set aside to touring people and what do you show them? No, great question. With any deal that we have out on the market, you know, we have a diligent marketing campaign where we send out on average, you know, for a 70s or 80s vintage value add asset, we'd probably have 150 to 200 people take down the package, look at it, study it. And then on average, we would probably give between 25 and 40 property tours on a given transaction. So specifically a property tour is myself or one of my partners would be with you set that up with one of the prospective buyers 99 percent of the time you tour with a property manager and they get to hear from us all the time so they really want to hear about the property management's day-to-day what they're experiencing what troubles they have at the property where you can feasibly push rents and create additional value right because that's what we're all looking for so on average that would take 30 to 45 minutes and we really let them spend the time with the manager and add little pieces about the submarket, about the area, uh, about recent trades in the market that property managers aren't as dialed into. And that's our responsibility. That's where we drive value. And that's a significant piece of propping up interest for the process. So somebody takes a tour, you guys are on the tour, you have the current property manager that's walking with you, is answering some of the questions. Maybe you talk to the maintenance person, you ask them a little bit about what's going on. You know, I always like that question that that, uh, I always like to throw out. If you had an extra $100,000, where would you put that money at? Asking the property manager on staff, and they're going to kind of give you their insight of where it goes. And it kind of gives you kind of a a funnel Mm -hmm. of where to maybe you should focus in on for rehab dollars under the property. But, you know, think about this. You don't have to answer it right now. But uh, what are some of the questions or what are some of the activities that people do when they go on these tours that you don't like and they shouldn't be doing? (laughs) As borrowers or as potential buyers? No, it's a, it's a good question. I think, you know, there are a lot of potential buyers who get on the property and sometimes, not always, kind of act as if, you know, they're running the show. And, you know, we always can notice that from a mile away. Typically, I always recommend a potential buyer, especially if you're newer into the business, that, you know, ask as many questions as you possibly can to the property manager. And most of the time, you may have a property manager who's only been there five or six months, and that's okay. But using your resources of people who have invested in those submarkets before, I think, is critical. People who have been there, sometimes historical perspective is a bad thing. But in this case, if you're really trying to put equity out to grow, you need as many different perspectives as possible. What's some of the questions that you you think, in your mind, are rookie questions that those people uh, shouldn't be asking I think there's probably a laundry list of of rookie questions, but I think I've I've, I've had a couple tours where the the potential buyer has stopped and wanted to ask you know tenants questions along the way. Can't do that. Can't, can't do that. And <laughs> <laughs> property managers ask me, hey, is he allowed to do that? Are he or she allowed to do that? So that's always a fun one to play defense and box out from that if if uh, the opportunity presents itself. But I, I think a lot of the things. Some of the best people that I really respect in this business that have done extremely well and grown serious portfolios like Mike and others, it's surface level questions, and then they do a lot of the due diligence behind the scenes. I think yeah. when you ask those questions to the property managers, a lot of the stuff that is 
you know, you're always looking for things physical and some of the best are always a little more silent and a little more quiet to where they're looking and I can tell they're absorbing a lot and maybe they save all those questions for me at the end of, you know, what have they done here on the other income side or some things on ancillary income because that sector, that segment of the business is such a profit center now yeah. compared to what it was four or five years ago. It's always, changing rapidly. Always, uh, I always think I'm probably one of your shorter tours. Right? No doubt. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> I get done in a half the time and then we'll chat afterwards for 10 or 15 minutes about the deal or the area or whatever else is going on in the marketplace. But, uh, yeah, I don't ask about the, uh, the Coke uh, contract of the Coke machine <laughs> that, you know, generates $10 a month in income, you know, and some people get down a rabbit hole that's immaterial to the grand scheme of the, the deal. It's not going to move the needle if I make 20 bucks on this Coke machine or $10 on this Coke machine a month. It doesn't matter. It's right. a $40 million deal. Can yeah. you ask about what the demographics are of the property? If so, all the time I hear the question of, hey, what's your average household income? Initially, property management companies are reluctant to give that information out. But once you kind of explain to them, hey, we're all we're all on the same team, we're trying to promote value, we have those conversations very early on so that property managers are as comfortable as they can be while still understanding that, hey, you and I are on the same team. I'm not trying to promote anything that also is unreasonable or the market wouldn't see as reasonable. Yeah, and I think to ask that question properly is like you ask the manager, who lives here? What do they do? What are the last several leases you sign? Where do they work? Mm-hmm. I think that's a better way of trying to get that same that same information. And then when you do, you lease file audit or you can just look at the average area median income because that should be in Joey's OM as right. well as many other independent data sources. You can get a sense of kind of who lives here and then, you know, just being observant, as Joey said, walking around, you see a bunch of beat up uh, cars that are missing hubcaps or whatever. Then, you know, it's a little different tenant profile than if you see a bunch of well-kept cars and, mm-hmm. you know, Mercedes uh, driving around the parking lot. So you can you can probably pick that up pretty quick. And one, one other recommendation I would give is some of the the best acquisition guys in the business sit down with the property manager and myself or one of my partners before they start walking and talking. That way you really understand the roadmap of what you're going to see. And then any questions you have can be vetted out on the front end. And I think it just ends up being a much more productive property tour than otherwise. Do you see a lot of the people that are looking to, you know, walk the property, you know, take the tour with you? Or do they come with a checklist in their hands that, you know, they may ask a series of 100 questions or guys like Mike that just are there to observe and kind of see what's going on and kind of listen to the pulse about what's going on in the property? I guess maybe some of the newbies have checklists of, of the questions that they want to ask. What are you seeing today in, like, say, this last deal, whatever this last deal was, and you had, a, let's say, 100, 100 tours? How many people were, like, institutional buyers that were like kind of like Mike, quasi-institutional buyers? And how many were just looking to get get their foot up into the price range that you guys are offering at? Sure. To the first part of your question, it depends on where the buyer is coming from. So if a buyer is flying in from – California, and they're trying to tour eight properties in a day, then I'd probably need a checklist as well to keep that all straight because, as Mike can probably attest, deals start running yeah. together <laughs> all in yeah. one day. And so to be able to avoid that, I think that's a good you know, organizational thing that people implement. If you're looking at one to two deals and you understand the sub-market, but I think the best thing that people implement is they keep it very, very simple and straightforward and don't lose sight of the fact that rent is where a majority of your NOI is coming from. And so where are the rents and understanding where that is in the stack? So that is probably the biggest difference I see between people who show up in properties. And then to the second part of your question for you know the two assets that we had out in the market, I'd say about 20 to 25% were institutional. You know, We talked about it a little bit before, but a lot of what we're seeing change in the last couple of years is people who were competitive on 15 to $20 million assets in 2015, 2016 are now in the, the group of the market that is being competitive in that 25 to $35 million airspace. And it's because they have more equity. They have people returning, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand dollar checks right back to them. I mean, capital is very readily available. So the, the two deals you uh, were just referencing, so there's two separate deals, two separate buyers, right? Mm-hmm. So one buyer, I think we were talking before, was an was a, a apartment syndicator essentially, right? So someone that took a $100,000 check and a bunch of $100,000 checks about the deal. Was the other group also uh, that similar setup or did they JV with like a private equity shop? The other, the other group is, uh, I'll say, a very prolific owner in town. And they own north of 20,000 units in Texas and Phoenix and other markets. And so they actually recapped it, brought in an institutional equity partner, 
about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're very IRR driven. So it was more of a three to four year hold horizon. So they're JV single source equity check, uh, JV. Yeah. So, and then that's what you're seeing. Cause you see a lot of guys like, like in my position, I think most of my competitors probably do the single source equity check. I, I would, I would imagine, I don't know if you have a different perspective and less of them do the kind of the bang it out a hundred thousand at a time. Like, like we do, cause it's a little bit easier from the perspective. You get one yes versus a hundred yeses or whatever. I have to go get on any particular deal, but you know, the equity is definitely different. Like you said, it's very IRR driven and you have very formulaic things you got to do. And it's, right. it's a very, um, much more formulaic than kind of what we do. So those are kind of maybe somewhere in the middle, but when you're looking at like truly differentiating to like a group like mine or just an apartment syndicator versus like a true institution that might buy one of the new development deals you guys are out there selling. What are some of the main differences between like, you know, a group like myself and when I'm going out and trying to put a deal and how I operate when I'm in escrow or trying to get an escrow versus say like a big wall street type firm, like a Blackstone or, you know, one of those, one of those Carlisle or one really large institution that also buys directly some of these investment assets. Yeah, it's a great question because I think there's, a lot of people out there, especially in the institutional space, who want to buy new core class A construction assets, they have the capital allocated to do that. But when they look at the underwriting and they look at the headline risk, as people bring up a lot in Dallas-Fort Worth with 40,000 new Just units under up. construction, what we've seen is institutions paint with a very broad brush. And they say, hey, look, we've got a portfolio of 30,000 units plus this is how my asset manager is telling me I have to run it. Mm -hmm. This is what happens with concessions on our last three acquisitions. And Joey, you're telling me this is going to be different. That's a very uphill battle that we have to fight on new construction, you know, whether it's in the core or, you know, suburban high profile sub markets Mm -hmm. in Dallas, Fort Worth. I'll say the difference with private family offices and private syndicators is that groups like yourselves are, very willing to get down into the weeds and tear it back submarket mm-hmm. by submarket. So the way we analyze new construction, for example, is if you look at MPF, it says MPF has, you know, 3,000 new units of the last couple of years in Las Colinas, as an example. Well, we actually strip that out and look at 12 to 14 month lease up horizons and how those units are being absorbed. There's plenty of submarkets like that, that We've reminded property managers that, hey, we know it's been choppy the last couple of years. We know it's been a challenge, but we're about to go into leasing season. It's January 2020 as we talk about it, and leasing season is right in front of us, and a lot of those units are absorbed. So don't be stuck in the past of where concessions were. Make sure we're continuing to push the envelope, and that translates into the sales side. Right, and as far as like how they go about operating, you know, so like I I know we go more institutional. They have investment committees and it's formulaic Mm -hmm. and – a lot of those uh, institutions won't go non-refundable day one. They have to have all these boxes checked before they're able to, to do that, where, where guys like uh, us are maybe a little more entrepreneurial, I guess, uh, maybe a way <laughs> of putting it, you know, investment committee of one. It's either we want to put our money up or we don't bet that we can go syndicate it. Any other kind of differences between kind of how they operate from that perspective? I think the biggest difference, too, is uh, there's been a lot of opportunities that I think institutional money has missed out on in the last three or four years. and groups like yourselves and others who have been proactively growing have made money, have grown value their portfolio and continued to have additional equity sources come to the table. So a lot of institutions don't need additional equity because yeah. they have funds that are raised. But from an operational standpoint, if I'm a major institution and I'm backing a sponsor, no matter how sophisticated that sponsor is, I'm going to be driving the boat. Yep. And that's the way it is because I need to report to my investment committee on a weekly, maybe daily basis to be able to report that things are going okay or if they're going sideways, if I need to take over. And so that's all negotiated up front, but that's the biggest difference. When you're a syndicator or it's all your own money, you drive the boat, you drive the operational decisions. So kind of maybe moving on, maybe the second part of the podcast, we can maybe talk a little bit about kind of the state of the market. As you mentioned, we're in January 2020 as we record this. Uh, You know, we're coming up here in a a week or or so. We're going to go to the National Multi-Housing Conference in Orlando and kind of the, the big annual conference with, you know, 12 plus thousand people, I think, uh, go to this thing. So I'm going to have about three or four meetings and Joe is going to have about <laughs> seemingly 300 meetings, but probably, you know, seriously, probably what, 15 to 20 meetings uh, for each of the two days? Definitely. I was looking at our schedule this morning um, and we'll probably have 12 meetings per day, not to mention 
I like to walk around and see people yeah. in passing that I'll see even for five minutes, and a lot comes out of those five-minute periods. So, yes, it will be very busy. So you yourself will have 12 to 15 meetings a day, and then Drew and the other guys will all have another 12 to 15 meetings, and some will be together, and but a lot of those will be separate on top of it. So your team is covering 100-plus people probably. Definitely. And, I mean, we, we again, we cover the state of Texas, right? So there's a lot of people who aren't in Dallas-Fort Worth that uh, I don't get to meet with yeah. m- more than just NMHC every year. So it's a really important conference for us. You come out of that feeling like you have the temperature of the market set with, again, a lot of inventory that's going to hit the market as well, especially with an election year yeah. looming. People want to get going very quickly in 2020. So kind of as we end in 2020, is that kind of what you're seeing? You guys are anticipating a pretty fast start to the year, a bunch of inventory about to hit the market, or just now hitting the market uh, as we're into the new the new year. So you think the first quarter or two will be pretty robust. And then do I infer that you guys are kind of anticipating a little bit of a, as far as a pullback in activity, maybe as people try to figure out what happens in the election until the, the certainty is kind of baked in the market. And then we'll kind of go with the new normal forward, whether it's the status quo or something different. I think so. I think from what I've been hearing through the grapevine, I know for what we're bringing to market over the course of the next 30 days, we have about half a billion dollars in inventory coming to market. And that's the entire spectrum of what I spoke about from new construction to 70s and 80s BNC value add. So I think we'll cover the gamut in terms of inventory. I do think from a timing perspective, and Paul can even speak to this a little bit, but I go back to last year, the agencies went on pause for what felt like a blip in time, which was a true 30-day period. And no one really knew Hey, if agencies were actually going to be at the table if I go buy a deal in the fourth quarter. And sure enough, that changed pretty dramatically. And now, in hindsight, it felt like a couple of days, right? So I relate that to the election. And I think I'm not going to give any political sure. opinions, but I wouldn't be surprised if we get to Q3, Q4, and it's business as usual. I think a lot of people feel the same way. However, there are those who are, you know, we're almost we're 10 plus years into this cycle, obviously cycles don't die of old age, but yeah. there are people who are going to be more cautious, just like they have been the last two. So what, what are you seeing? So as far as like, maybe Paul can talk about the uh, Paul, maybe talk about the debt before we talk about equity. What's your impression of uh, the debt markets right now as far as like the ability, the li- liquidity in the marketplace, the agencies, non-agency lenders, you know, what, what's the uh, appetite for debt right now? A hundred percent thumbs up, green green lights across every Spectrum, whether it's Fannie Mae or it's Freddie Mac or uh, CMBS or any of the debt funds, it's 100% uh, go. So if we were launching a, a rocket to the moon and we were around the table, everyone's would be thumbs up and we're ready to launch. So I don't really think that the election is going to have that big of an impact. The only thing I do question is actually 2021. And if Trump does get reelected again in the downsizing or the the casting off of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac of being under the, the government umbrella and have it become more privatized, that that's going to have a little bit of an impact. That's kind of what we felt in June, July, going into August of, of last year. And that was a little bit of apprehension that if the government guarantee wasn't in there and we were having to do transactions through like a CMBS execution, what kind of an impact is that going to have for investors? So as I said, uh, you know, as I say right now, the store is open. Come on, take all you, you can, and let's get it on. As far as, like, the equity goes, what are your conversations? I mean, the term I think I heard, I don't know if it was Greg Willard or somebody said, like, they kind of described the equity out in the marketplace as, like, a wall of capital coming at the multifamily space. And uh, that certainly felt pretty true as of last year. And then, you know, a couple of deals that we're, we're kind of trying to trying to sell right now, it kind of feels that way mm-hmm. right now. Any, well, any difference? Well, yeah, let's, let's t- kind of talk a little bit about that wall of capital. Is that wall of capital coming in from the coasts? Are you seeing a lot more calls that are coming in from, say, New York to buy stuff in Texas? Are you seeing calls coming in from California and the, uh, the crisis going on with rent control in some of these states? Are they – are trying to come to a purely very business-friendly environment like like Texas? I I think there's no question. I I don't think that it's any different from the last couple of years. I think there's a lot of coastal capital that's been trying to get into Texas, uh, specifically Dallas-Fort Worth. You know, a lot of people put an emphasis on even international capital. There's a lot of international capital flooding into the states, but all that international capital is coming in through 
people who have flags planted in the United States through funds or other vehicles that resemble it. But no question, I agree with the wall of capital comment wholeheartedly. I do think that people are, it goes back to our earlier point, people are trying to find a way to be able to put out more capital in the value add and the new construction space. But as tight as the market is, um, there are other options right now that we have to remember. It's not just Texas. When you talk to these guys that want to buy properties on the institutional side, they usually have a bogey what they need for a yield Mm -hmm. on it. What goes into the green and what goes into the yellow or red? Of what type of a, of a yield are they able to, to generate on these properties? Sure. You know, major institutions like the Carlisles of the world and Besco's focus on unlevered yields. What does that mean, levered deals? Unlevered. Unlevered deals? Mm-hmm. Un- unlevered yields is just if I bought this asset all cash, what would the cash. return be? And they're measuring, you know, a Carlisle, for example, has allocations of capital across all product types, not only in real estate, but also other avenues of private equity. And so they have to make sure the real estate isn't underperforming, right? So if I look at, you know, core yield, for example, it's six, six and a half in a market like this. So that's their bogey for value add returns that are levered. And I'm putting 60 to 70% leverage maybe on an asset, then that would be more of a 11 to 13 IRR. Mid-teens IRR is kind of the the bogey that's thrown around. But in reality, I don't see how a lot of these institutions are hitting that bogey necessarily. Do so you think it's like 11 to 13 is kind of the range where they're they're making, uh, putting the capital to work? I do. And for highly sought after value add, for markets that are, you know, your A markets in Dallas-Fort Worth, mm-hmm. your Plano's, Frisco's, Irving's, then those are the markets where they're really targeting that. So as far as uh, as that goes, so you you're feeling like 2020 early indications. I know we're a week or two ahead of you. Really having a good pulse of the marketplace, but there's as much or more capital right now than any point in the last two years. Is that pretty accurate? I would agree with that statement, and I think it's more urgent this year than it has been in the last two <clears throat> years, just given the the things that we've already talked about. In this yeah, a lot circle. of buyers, you know, they they want to talk about capital, but they really want to find about inventory. Absolutely. So. You know, what's your take right now about inventory, about what's available out there, and why why are people selling these days? I mentioned the amount of inventory that we have coming out at MHC. I know we're not the only ones. I mean, we're top, as of 2019, and we track this very meticulously, we're a top two shop in terms of volume in Dallas Fort Worth, so we have a good pulse on that. Uh, I think why they're selling, there are a lot of people who have hit their business plans earlier than they anticipated, and maybe they have a five- to seven-year horizon for an investment and they hit the rents that they expected to hit in year five, they hit them in year two and three. And so people are trying to recycle that capital out because if I don't do that, then it's tough to grow. I can't just keep the cash in these assets and hang on to them for seven to 10 years if I'm trying to grow a portfolio and become a robust operator or sponsor. And the challenge is is to take that capital and find another asset. Absolutely. And we, we hear that on a daily basis, especially for people who have done extremely well and bought assets in 2010 and 2011 coming out of the recession. And the common answer over the phone is, Joey, I'd love to sell, but where would I put the capital? And that's where we show them a laundry list of opportunities of either new construction or earlier 2000s vintage. And I say, look, you can take that equity and trade into something newer that's safer asset, less of a CapEx headache. Um, There's a lot of opportunities that people are very comfortable, and it's our job to try to get them to move into different products. How about getting them comfortable with secondary markets? Tell me a little bit about what your take is on secondary markets. I mean, you guys do a lot of business in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Austin, San Antonio, in Houston, but some of these secondary markets, whether it is Waco or it is uh, some of these areas of Georgetown up and down the, the 35 corridor, what's your take on some of these smaller secondary markets? I think the biggest opportunity in those markets, there there are a lot of groups who are comfortable going within a two to three hour drive of Dallas Fort Worth, and it goes back to the search for yield. So, you know, an average value add deal, whether it's 80s or early 90s vintage construction, cap rates are on top of each other. If I look at Dallas Fort Worth, really between that four and a half to 495 mark, cap rates are extremely tight. So, if I want to find yield that is a a discount to that and have better yield walking in the door. A Waco, a Tyler, Midland, Odessa is very much so roaring back with where oil is north of $60 a barrel. So we have a lot of deals that have grown rents 
or grown overall revenue over a hundred grand year for year. So it, it's quite amazing what's happening out there. But you have to have a certain appetite to go to these secondary markets because there are challenges. So are you? Are you? I always joke that everything's a five cap, and it's kind of kind of not a joke. It's pretty close to reality. But are you saying? From your perspective on the deals you sold, you sold a couple 80s deals uh, that we referenced a little bit earlier, and you sold, uh, you're selling a couple, you know, kind of newer construction or new construction deals. Are the cap rates literally pretty much within 50 bips of each other, regardless of age, generally speaking, you know, for comparable locations in the metropolitan area? I think they are. And I, I mean, I always look at the historical before I give a, any sort of opinion on where we are, because I think it's important to look at where we were. But 2015, 2016, cap rates, the, the spread was more, you know, from C to A class product was probably 50 to 75 basis points. And I do think that spread has come in by about 25 to 40 basis points. Uh, I just think of the BOVs that we're doing now, and the cap rate looks the same as a late 90s, well located asset that has value add or an asset that's maybe been renovated 50 to 60 percent, but we still call that a value add deal because value add is what the market is hungriest for. So these properties that you guys are selling, again, 80s, fairly large properties, because you were saying that $60 million is kind of your, your sweet spot or where you guys were selling properties. But but you guys are kind of changing that to go down to maybe $40 million or even $30 million or so as an average and sometimes lower down to $20 million, up to, maybe up to 45 is kind of the, that sweet spot. But that's typically not a brand new player that's coming into the market. So, you know, I'm like I'm looking for a message of hope. So a lot of people, you know, start off with just maybe a small single asset, and they've doubled it up to, to say, you know, from 50 doors up to 150 doors. Now they want to make a, a transition up to say 250 doors or so. I'm going to go through this to Mike. Any advice for the guys making that transition to go up to meet Joey? Yeah, I, mean, I think I think what. Oh, he could certainly speak from his perspective, but uh, you know, I think as he mentioned, a lot of a lot of guys when you're starting out, especially if you're a syndicator, or you take that single source equity check from a private equity shop. You need to recycle that capital because you know it's it's one thing to to take it and deliver them seven eight percent cash on cash, but it's another thing to then turn one dollar into two over a two three year period, and then that money kind of comes back in, in spades. So you can grow exponentially. So as you're looking to grow, you have to almost go full cycle on these deals. By selling them, I mean, refinancing is nice, but even selling them is even better and then kind of get that proof of concept. And then, you know, usually when you, you take one dollar and you give two back, usually four or five come your way on the next deal and just kind of able right. to grow exponentially. And then I think by doing that, then you then speak to uh, Joey can then speak to the potential sellers of these properties. Hey, this group has this track record. This is what they've done. And then that becomes a little bit more impressive as you scale up. I don't know if you have a slightly different perspective or anything else to add to that. The, the one other comment I'd add, I think that was well said. The other one comment is if I was a property owner who owned 50 to 100 unit properties and I'm ready to make that next jump to 200 to 300 unit assets, to me, that's extremely exciting. We've talked about how competitive it is. However, there are less constraints on CapEx. There are less constraints on just the day-to-day issues that happen with these 5 to $10 million assets that are flat roof or mansard roof and boiler chiller type systems. To me, that would make me stay up at night. And this is an exciting point of that transition to be able to be at the table for some of the better, well-located assets yeah, in the it's market. A, it's a paradigm shift because you, right. your thinking was when you were buying this property, it was the late 60s, flat roof property, kind of, kind of a challenging demographic area. You do stay up night thinking about uh, what happens to the, uh, some of these underground water pipes, how water pipes blow up or the roof has water penetration. So when you go up to the next level, you know, these properties that were built in the 80s, 90s, and, and up to the 2000s, it's pitch roof individual HVACs, new new technology to keep these properties going. And so it is a little bit same type of asset because it's, it's housing, but much better, higher quality asset these days than it was 40 or 50 years ago. But I guess a lot of these people start off at the, the older properties and work their way up. Yeah. A couple of last little topics maybe before we kind of wrap this thing up here. I know one of the things we keep seeing these prices go up and up and up. And so kind of the last eight years uh, I've been doing this as a principal and you've been doing it long as a lender. Kind of seems like in the time I've been buying multifamily deals that the, the rents in Dallas-Fort Worth have pretty much doubled and the prices have tripled. Something like that. So in that kind of general ballpark from kind of the, the, the when I when I entered the market and if you really from the bottoms, maybe it's even more in some of the workforce um, on a percentage basis. 
Uh, and that kind of kind of speaks to the strength of the. It's not just cap rate compression. There certainly is some cap rate compression that causes the prices out outpace the, the rents. But the rents have materially increased on some of these deals. And then, as we as you mentioned earlier, there's you know forty thousand units uh, currently under development somewhere in that ballpark in Dallas Fort Worth, and about twenty five thousand I think delivered last year, and somewhere around twenty five thirty thousand will deliver this year. And as we're seeing the prices kind of creep up in the workforce housing, I think at the same time we're also still seeing you know ever increasing construction cost on the new supply with land, labor, material, everything becoming a little bit more expensive and more challenging to uh, to make these things uh, make sense. Do you have a sense of kind of you started um, on the investment sales five years ago from where you started kind of where construction costs is to kind of today on a very similar deal, maybe like your suburban, you know, North Fort Worth or suburban, you know, kind of Plano type type location. How much have construction costs gone up? If you can, you know, maybe maybe swag that for everybody to kind of get a sense of where that is. And do you see that continuing or is there any slowing down of that? Sure. On, on average, construction costs – and it varies from year to year, just given what's going on with China and different implications that that provides. But on average, construction costs have gone up about four to five percent a year has been the number that we've quoted since you know 2014, 2015. That's hard costs. Yeah, that, that's that's all in. I mean, when you look at the breakdown of suburban, if I was going to build you know a wrap in Addison, hard costs are about one eighty to one eighty five a door with plus extra- dirt or with dirt. That's with their, yeah. but then plus 20 to 25% soft costs that on top of that, right? So I'm looking at that plus a 25% profit on top of that. That's really difficult when I don't have trades in that airspace yet. Yeah. But one thing I'd like to point to is you think about the laundry list of topics that we've covered, and all these are very positive fundamentals, right? There are a lot of other options and markets in the United States that don't provide half of the things that we have here, right? We've got over 100,000 jobs a year. We've got, we talked about equity and debt being readily available. Our only, you know, top-down pressure really in the last couple of years has been supply, and developers aren't slowing down because it's a lot harder to slow down the machine than it is to, <laughs> to start yeah. it up and ramp yeah. it up. So I can assure you of that. But there's still great opportunities to be had where a lot of people think the market is overpriced or overvalued right now. We have that affordability component, which but, is attractive. But without getting too deep and too specific here, you guys are trading deals in the northern suburban market. Brand new, really nice stuff for two fifteen a door ish, two twenty a door ish, and then there's the next deal down the street delivering, and their hard their their construction costs are almost uh, on top of your your most recent sales comps, and so they're they're building at the same price that you're just selling the comp, and hope two years later to sell it for twenty percent more. Is that kind of generally the dynamic you're seeing out in the marketplace? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, we had three trades at the end of the year in North Dallas and kind of central Dallas, Fort Worth that were north of 235 a unit. So to me, if I'm a value add operator, that's music to my ears of the spread to where new construction is trading. If I can be, you know, a 20 to 30 percent discount to that, I feel really good about that disparity for where I am for my renovated rents or renovated costs is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So and then and then finally, maybe one of the things we always like to ask, I didn't give you a heads up about this, but Paul, lighting, uh, lighting talking, question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is there any uh, <laughs> any sort of funny or interesting stories you might uh, you might have kind of you're touring all the all the you know thousands or tens of thousands of units you toured and hundreds, if not thousands of uh, property tours, any sort of funny things? One, one of the things that. Paul mentioned uh, we were buying a deal, and Paul went out and toured it uh, with me one day, and uh, we were touring a unit, and he walks in a unit, and all of a sudden there was like an aquarium. It had it had three ponds on the property, and there was an aquarium with like two live ducks in there, and it was like going to be dinner for this guy who not, stole a couple Not of ducklings, <laughs> but big ducks. <laughs> Certainly, you've had to walk into some tenant's unit to some property tour and see something crazy <laughs> on an asset. I'm trying to think. There are a lot of crazy things that happen and, and stories that I've heard on assets just in general. It's always fun when we, whenever we whenever we sell an asset or about to bring an asset to market, we always we do a, a nice infographic of yards and other ancillary income that you can put together. And so either myself or some of our other junior brokers who help out on the execution side will walk all of the property. And so seeing somebody in a coat and tie around some of these value-added properties, we always have people stop and ask us what we're doing. I mean, when we say we're counting potential fences, that's always a weird That's always a weird story to wrap their head around. You're, usually. you're counting what? Potential yards, so oh, like pet yards oh, to do, yards. to just to add value. I'm sure there are some other stories that I've yeah, had that yeah. I can't think Should of right now. Up, so. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, that's... That, uh... 
when you find yourself in the property and uh, you look definitely out of place in some of these properties in, in the middle of the afternoon and you have some of these tenants that have lived there, they kind of know who exactly should be on the property and who shouldn't be on the property and you uh, kind of stand out, they will ask you questions. And I think that's good part of security that if they do ask you questions about what are you doing here, do you own the place? So uh, the good answer, what you had is, you know, we're, we're counting and looking for, for to add fences. I always use a part of the insurance company. Yeah, we're just well. – Looking at it, at the property. For it's a pro tip. If any tenant ever asks if you own the place, it's always no. I'm, uh, no, no. I'm an insurance guy. <laughs> <laughs> actually, one now that's coming to mind, we sold a uh, – or we actually marketed a seniors deal, seniors living, assisted living. And so you have tenants who come through, and they come through with their entire families because the son's got to sign off, daughter's got to sign off. Um, so this lady who was a little bit older was in a wheelchair and – I was in the gym. We were looking at the amenities. My partner, Drew, and I were standing there, and we were in our suit and ties. And she just looked up at us, and she was like, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> we were like, oh, we're just... <laughs> my initial reaction was we're looking for a place to live. That's <laughs> what I said. This is early on. <laughs> and she looked up. She was like, no, you're not. You're up to no good. <laughs> she, she could spot me from a mile away, and I walked out of the gym not knowing how else to continue. So that's that's my one where I got caught out pretty early. That's yeah. That's pretty funny. So. So uh, we'll finish this off. Now, Joey, if, if someone wanted to get more information about what you do and maybe your email address, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Sure. My email is jtuminello, T-U-M-M-I-N-E-L-L-O, at ipausa.com. And then our website is ipatexasmultifamily.com. Uh, we have our inventory updated on a daily basis, and my V cards on there. If any other contact information is needed. So, you know, if you didn't see Joey before he walked in, he was dancing the jig coming from New Orleans and being home of uh, the LSU Tigers. The Tigers were going to win either way. So, you know, it was a magical run. I went to TCU, so I get a lot of grief for that of being an LSU fan. But I, I was born and raised going to LSU games, and uh, it was a pretty magical night to see the Tigers bring it home in New Orleans. And I guarantee Bourbon Street was uh, <laughs> alive the whole night. Probably might still be at this point. So it's, I'm sure it's a fun it night. certainly was. Joey, thanks for hanging out with us. We definitely very much appreciate all your insight about what's going on yeah, with uh, with the IPA, the Institutional Property Advisors, with Marcus and Chapel, another great operation that's in uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth area that kind of covers just the state of Texas. And if you need some information about what's going on throughout the country, they can put you in contact with the right people too at some of the other IPA offices throughout the the country. So, Michael Becker, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks. We appreciate that. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.